Hello, this is Ben with the Green Hill and another Come Follow Me message. I call this Giving It All to the Lord. So, over the last few weeks, we've been learning about the Israelites, and there's been a lot of times where they've struggled. They've, you know, had a tough time following Moses, following the Lord, um, you know, bickering, complaining, murmuring, worshiping golden calves. So, there's been some downsides. For sure, but this week we're studying the last part of Exodus through Leviticus, and there's some real highlights here for the the children of Israel, and what could unite a people more than uh, the tabernacle, or in our day the temple. So in the end of Exodus, um, Moses has already received the instructions on how to build the temple. Now. Basically, he needs the people to to put in the work, and that's exactly what they do. In Exodus 36, verse 1, it says, Then wrought Bezali and Aholiab, and every wise-hearted man in whom the Lord put wisdom and understanding to know how to work all manner of work for the service of the sanctuary, according to all that the Lord had commanded. So the Lord is putting people in places where they could really shine. You know, these these two men here, names in particular, they are obviously great worksmen, um, and they can do, you know, this fine workmanship that the Lord needs. And then it also says that every wise-hearted man, they're all contributing here. And in verse 2 it says, And Moses called Bezali, Bezalel, I don't know how to say it, and Aholiab, and every wise-hearted man, in whose heart the Lord had put wisdom, even every one whose heart stirred him up to come unto the work to do it. So they're feeling this burning inside to like, hey, let's let's pitch in, let's all help and do this work uh, for the Lord. Later, we read about uh, building the tabernacle. It says, and they received of Moses all the offerings which the children of Israel had brought for the work of the service of the sanctuary to make it withal. And they brought yet unto him free offerings every morning. So every morning the people are bringing in everything that they find, you know, gold, uh, scarlet, purple, you know, whatever it is that, that they could build this tabernacle with. Every morning they just keep bringing it to these these workmen. And uh, and then in verse 4, And all the wise men that wrought all the work of the sanctuary came every man from his work which they made. And they spake unto Moses, saying, So now these are, this is, you know, those two main um, craftsmen. They say, The people bring much more than enough for the service of the work which the Lord commanded to make. So this is, you know, kudos to the Israelites. They're they're catching the spirit of this work and they they bring so much and they give so much of themselves that you know these craftsmen they're saying look we have way more than we need they've they've brought everything that that we could possibly use and then in Exodus 39 verse 32 it says thus was all the work of the tabernacle of the tent of the congregation finished and the children of Israel did according to all that the Lord commanded Moses. So they did. So they they shined here. They they gave of everything that they had, and they were able to build this beautiful tabernacle. And um, what was the result of that? Well, the Lord made it His. In Exodus forty, we read, "Then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation." And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And then in Leviticus, uh, we read about all the, the different types of sacrifices that they're supposed to make. And, and they learn how to serve the Lord in the tabernacle uh, through burnt offerings. Burnt offerings are uh, for a, a general atonement of sin, an expression of devotion to God. Grain offerings. Uh, this was to express your devotion to God and recognizing His goodness and providence. There's peace offerings. This is the purpose of this was uh, 
to consecrate a meal between two or more parties before God and share that meal together in fellowship of peace and a commitment to each other's future prosperity. Prosperity, sorry. Um, so, you know, peace between your neighbors um, and between God. Sin offering. This offering is a little bit different than the burnt offering. It's uh, more atonement for the, the unintentional sin, um, sometimes viewed as a guilt offering, you know, removing the consequences of, you know, our lack of perfection. And then they also uh, learned about a guilt offering, or some people call it a trespass offering. This is, um, you know, it was to make repar repar how do you say that word? Uh, reparations for one's sin. And it was actually like a monetary um, thing that you would do. Like, look, I, I feel like I sinned against my brother. I'm going to pay this amount. I, I think that sin was a, worth that amount. And so the, the Israelites were able to learn how to sacrifice. Um, and all these sacrifices actually pointed towards their Savior, Jesus Christ, and ultimately the atonement, um, bringing them uh, whole with their their Lord and Savior and, and their Heavenly Father. So, in studying this, I, I thought there was a lot of similarities um, when the saints built the Kirtland Temple. So, this, this temple was built at a time of extreme poverty for the saints. You know, when, when Joseph Smith arrived in Kirtland, he he had to set some things straight with the saints. You know, just like the Israelites, they were struggling with different things and, you know, started worshiping a calf. The saints in the Kirtland era, they were, you know, worshiping strange spirits uh, getting strange revelations, things like that, where, you know, when Joseph arrived, he really had to clean things up. Um, but but then he received the revelation on uh, building this temple, just like Moses did. Moses went up into the mount, received specific instructions. So did Joseph Smith. In fact, the first presidency saw envisioned the temple, and I think it was Frederick Williams, uh, he counted recounted how like they saw it from the outside and then once the the first presidency had all seen it then all of a sudden it was like they were on the inside and they saw how everything was supposed to be done on the inside and and so they had the plans but they needed the manpower and and really they were kind of a meager group at this time but just like the lord inspired the people the israelites to you know, come together and really build this tabernacle. The same thing happened with the Kirtland Temple. Uh, Joseph Smith was recounting the difficulties of, you know, what they needed to do to, you know, build the outside and and what they would need and and who they would need and and they didn't have these people and and then uh, Lorenzo Young, he overheard it and he said. I know the very man who is capable of doing this work, Artemis Millet. The prophet then turned to Brigham and he said, I give you a mission to go to Canada and baptize brother Artemis Millet and bring him here. Tell him to bring a thousand dollars with him. And that's exactly what happened. So the Lord, the Lord put into these great men, uh, you know, the, that fire of, look, this is the Lord's work. Artemis Millet came as a, a great um, architect. Same with Truman O. Angel. He was a, a magnificent architect that came and helped. And everyone pitched in. On every seventh day, every wagon in Kirtland uh, was commissioned and summoned to haul stone from the quarry. Uh, the women donated everything that they had. Uh, church members labored. Uh, with building materials, cutting stone. They even gave their glass and pottery so that that could be ground into uh, pieces of um, the stucco. And it, it kind of made the stucco like glimmer and shine, 
making it beautiful. And everyone did their part and they were able to, to build this beautiful temple. Some people have estimated that the cost of this temple, if it was measured by what the people had at that time, that it would have, you know, per capita been the most expensive religious building in American history. Uh, they had that much little, sorry, they had that little, but they gave that much sacrifice. And because of the great sacrifice that they put in, it, it uh, you know, the dedication of the Kirtland Temple was something spectacular. It truly was a day of Pentecost. Um, children from the outside that couldn't be in the dedication um, talked about seeing angels on the rooftop. One child, too young to understand, told his mother there were people walking on top. And the people that were in the dedication were not surprised at all to hear that account because inside there were also angels. Uh, the gifts of tongues uh, were present. Same with interpretation. There was an account of two people standing up and just suddenly singing in harmony a perfect song in a different language. And then a, a different person would stand up and translate what they had sung. Uh, there was an account of a, a babe, only two months. Uh, the babe's mouth was open and they were able to participate in the Hosanna shout. It reminds me of in Third Nephi when um, when Christ visited the Americas and the, the babe's mouths were open and they were able to preach sermons so incredible that um, that, that people you know, weren't supposed to write what, what they had taught. Um, yeah, it was, it was truly spectacular, uh, what took place here. I was able to visit the Kirtland temple with my son, Ethan, and it was a, a beautiful experience. I remember going to the Kirtland temple on the church history tour twice. Uh, we were able to go there and sitting in in the Kirtland Temple and singing the Spirit of God like a fire is burning and and the Holy Ghost testifying that this is you know where the the Lord um, first was able to build a home um, through his people you know in in the New Testament we read about Christ um, you know, that even the fox has a, a place to to rest, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Finally, through the Kirtland Temple, the Lord was able to again have a house on the earth that was was his and for his people. And just like the Lord visited the tabernacle uh, through a fire of you know, a fire of smoke, a pillar of fire over the tabernacle. The Lord also visited the Kirtland Temple in the Doctrine and Covenants. We, DNC 110, verse 2, it says, this is uh, Joseph Smith and Oliver Cow Cowdery. They said, We saw the Lord standing upon the breastwork of the pulpit before us, and under his feet was paved a work of pure gold in the color amber. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and hair of his head was white like pure snow. His countenance shone above the brightness of the sun, and his voice was as the sound of the rushing of great waters, even the voice of Jehovah, saying, I am the first and the last. I am he who liveth. I am he who was slain. I am your advocate with the Father. Behold, your sins are forgiven you. You are clean before me. Therefore, lift up your heads and rejoice. Let the hearts of your brethren rejoice, and let the hearts of all my people rejoice, who have with their might built this house to my name. Behold, I have accepted this house, and my name shall be here, and I will manifest myself to my people in mercy in this house. I can't think of a greater thing 
than the Lord saying, your sins are forgiven you, and I accept you and the work that you've done. That just had to be so overwhelmingly peaceful. And, you know, thinking why why such the marvelous experience here at the Kirtland Temple? Um, why the pillar of fire at the tabernacle? I think it was because of the sacrifice that the people were willing to put into it. The spirit that they, they felt in that work and giving their all to the Lord. Um, so, you know, the question for us would be, you know, are we willing to give it all to the Lord? And, and in what ways can we do that? I leave that with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.